So tell us about the week that was in the United Nations. Um, very eventful week. <laughs> um, we had a lot of um, big speeches, um, some actually pretty positive um, commentary. Um, to me, the most memorable speeches were um, Javier Milei, the president of Argentina, who stood up there and in detail torched the UN for everything they do wrong. Um, and the, the other memorable speech that was positive to me was Nayib Bukele, the president of El Salvador, um, who said the free world is not free. And he, he didn't name the United States, but he was clearly talking about us. He was mentioning how um, stores have to put things like razors behind security apparatuses because there's too much crime. People can't go out on the street at night. And he compared that to his own country and basically said, you know, we, we're on the precipice of something really bad here if we don't change um, so those messages really resonated for me. And then there was sort of the litany of um, the Middle Eastern leaders who are sympathetic to Hamas attacking Israel for defending itself from Hamas. Um, uh, Erdogan, the president of Turkey, was the loudest one. He went on for 40 minutes about um, how Hamas is, you know, a legitimate uh, resistance organization and that Israel is, is like Hitler. Um, and, of course, we had Mahmoud Abbas, the Palestinian leader who... Um, gave a huge speech where he said that we have to kick Israel out of the UN. Um, mind you, he's the president of something that is not a country. So <laughs> he's already on thin ice being there, and he's saying that another legitimate country shouldn't be at the UN. Oh, that's great. Classic. But that makes sense. Makes, that, that, all, that all fits. Um, going back to the president of El Salvador. So I believe last we chatted, maybe two times ago, you were hesitant to give too much support to the new president of El Salvador. Uh, where, where do you, because I mean, that's fine. It was wise. It was, uh, well, let's just wait and see. Let's see how things go. Uh, how are things going? Well, I, I can't deny that he's been a tremendously effective president. Um, El Salvador is a much better country than it was five years ago when he became president. Um, he eradicated the gangs completely. Um, it's, it's a situation where, you know, Salvadoran families couldn't use their public parks because if they tried to bring their kids to play soccer there, the gangs would rec recruit the kids. Um, that is not the reality anymore. Um, my hesitancy is that, A, he's a politician. I don't trust any of them. And, B, he is one of the most powerful world leaders right now because he was elected in a legitimate election with upwards of 80% of the vote, just a, a demolishing historic landslide. And he's working under the state of emergency decree that invalidates a lot of constitutional restrictions on executive power. So he is very, very powerful, and if he chooses to abuse that power, he can do so very quickly, um, and he can turn very quickly. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that he has. That doesn't mean there's any evidence that he will, but he's a politician with a lot of power, so we always have to be watchful um, and not trust people that are granted that much authority. Yes, yes, so interesting. So right now he's a... A benevolent dictator. Exactly. Is that a thing? <laughs> is that, yeah, is that, is, that, is that possible? I don't know well, how long that can, that can be a thing. I would call him a dictator because he was elected in a, in a fair and square election. No one questions that he won yeah. with 80, 85% of the vote. Um, that that was crazy. a legitimate election. It's just crazy how there's no opposition anymore in El Salvador that's effective. Well, uh, so this is the line that you quoted and, and we spent a lot of time on. He said, in El Salvador, we prioritize the safety of our honest citizens over the comfort of our criminals. And we went into a whole thing about Kamala Harris because Kamala Harris uh, was attorney general when there was prison realignment in California because there were too many prisoners. It was overcrowded. And the Supreme Court said that was cruel and unusual punishment. So there was a prison realignment, they called it. So put a bunch of prisoners in jails, and then the jails were overcrowded, so they had to release the jail people in jail onto the streets. And then out of that, they passed Prop 47, which said you can steal anything up to $950, and it's just a misdemeanor because they wanted to keep people out of jails. They wanted to keep the keep criminals comfortable. And then Prop 57, I'm sorry, friends, I'm just doing this again because I'm doing it every day because I want everyone to know this. Yes. Uh, Prop 57 said all these nonviolent felonies, everyone's granted early parole or eligible for early parole, and nonviolent felonies included rape of an unconscious person, uh, child abduction, elder abuse, uh, assault with a deadly weapon was considered a nonviolent felony. And the whole point of this was to keep people out of the jails because we want everyone to be, well, we're prioritizing the comfort of criminals. Anyway, uh, he said, some say we've jailed thousands, but the reality is we've liberated millions. I just wish we had that mindset here, right? Yeah, I agree. And, and you know, I would say that he is 
there is something libertarian about the way Bukele acts in a, in a very Latin American way, which is different from what we're used to here. Um, I think in the United States, libertarianism basically means we don't trust the government, therefore we don't trust the laws, therefore the police should be defanged um, and, and not you know, granted the authority to enforce the laws because most of the laws are nonsense anyway. Um, Bukele's approach is there should be very few laws. Um, he's a very free market guy. He's made it way easier to ma- make a small business in El Salvador. He actually features on his social media, you know, random small businesses every day, trying to get people um, a leg up. But he's limited kind of the number of laws that are enforced. But the few that he enforces, he enforces very, very hard. So organized crime, terrorism, um, violent crime, um, uh, things like extorting small businesses. Um, the police are completely empowered in El Salvador to do what they need to do to get the criminals off the streets. And, and I'm sure there's listeners who are saying, how is that libertarian? And, and my response would be that uh, the laws that are being enforced are laws where there's very little disagreement among the general population of El Salvador that these things are crimes. Whereas in the United States, a lot of the driving of the skepticism of using police action is that you'll get violent raids against a farmer for selling raw milk, stuff like that. Um, These are laws that are not sensible. Um, And I think he's limited himself to enforcing the sensible laws very hard and then expanding everybody else's freedom. Okay, that's good. Um, how is the experiment with the Argentinian guy going? It's going pretty well. Um, foreign uh, foreign money going back into Argentina hit a record high last month. It's not foreign investment. It's basically money that Argentines were hiding in foreign banks because the Argentine economy was so weak that if you put it in in um, in their money in pesos in their banks, it would you know instead of multiplying in the bank, it would like have because the price of the, the currency was dying. So now Argentines are taking all their money, putting it back in their hometown banks, which is a very positive move. Um, there are some concerns that you know unemployment is growing a little bit. That's partly because the state was so bloated. There were so many government jobs before Millet, and he's just firing everybody. Um, he shut down like the Ministry for Women. He's cutting the Ministry for Sport significantly. Um, so, th- so there's a lot of people that are losing jobs. But that is also money that the government is now not, the taxpayer money that the government is not spending, uh, that is going back to the people. So I think in the long term, it's looking really good. Um, okay. Did Joe Biden do anything of note at the UN? No. Um, I, I tried to listen to his speech. I couldn't get through it. And, and I, I'll caveat that with, I love the UN General Assembly. I, no one loves that event more than me. It is so fun for me. And I could not get through his speech. It was so boring. So I read it. Um, and there was nothing of note. It was just zero leadership, um, sort of, and nothing you haven't heard before. Um, there was, you know, a paragraph on defending Ukraine, a paragraph on climate change, a paragraph on multilateralism. Um, he did have the decency to say that the October 7th massacre was bad, um, but there was just nothing in there that, that was original or thought-provoking in any way. Um, what about the guy from Haiti. Do you know where I'm going with the rest of the story? Yes. Well, I, I think the, okay. the takeaway for most people was just that he was drinking out of a jug of water. <laughs> sure, sure. That, that would be, that's what happened. Just real quick, just so everyone knows what happened. And I, I don't know. It depends how, I don't know. How many points do you want to make with The guy, I don't know who he is. Some Haitian politician is up behind him. You know, the big thing with the green stone behind him. And he grabs, instead of a cup of water, he grabs the pitcher of water and tries to drink from the pitcher and it gets all over. <laughs> like, he does like an ice bucket challenge <laughs> on his shirt with the water. And I, do you, what, what do you, what do you get from this? Because in America, remember we made fun of Marco Rubio. For yeah, that's what I was going to say. Remember when we decided okay. <laughs> Marco Rubio isn't allowed to be president because he drank out of a bottle of water like a normal person. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's uh, now. If Marco Rubio poured water over his head trying to be hydrated, then I think that would be maybe a justifiable reason to not be present. Um, but has this fella not seen a pitcher before? Did he just think this was a large cup? Uh, he was probably nervous. I mean, like Marco Rubio, this this man he's actually received way fewer votes to be the president of Haiti than than Marco Rubio has uh, received to be president of the United States. Um, and he's, he's not the president. He's the head of 
something called the Transitional Presidential Council, which is this um, nebulous thing that Anthony Blinken came up with um, to fill the power void in Haiti. So Haiti hasn't had a legitimate president since 2021. Um, we all know what happened. Someone broke into the presidential palace and shot him in the head, and that, that's it. They assassinated the president. They haven't had a president since. Um, they had a prime minister who was not elected and widely hated. And then the gangs who took over the country essentially exiled him. Um, he flew he flew to Kenya to get the Kenyans to send police forces to Haiti. And when he flew in the middle of the flight back, the gangs just took over the, the prime minister's office and didn't let him come back. So he got stranded in Puerto Rico for a while. Um, and then there was a complete void. No one was in charge for several months. So Blinken comes in and he says, we need a transitional council with respectable people on it. So he got a bunch of bureaucrats on it that no one in Haiti knows or cares about. And they're running the show. So this guy who's speaking, who I, I'm sorry, I don't even remember his name, um, is the head of the transitional council. And he goes up there and, you know, and the jug of water maybe was a distraction because the speech was outrageous. Um, he, called for, oh, <laughs> he called for international reparations for Haiti from everyone they, basically he said the, the circumstances surrounding the independence of haiti which if people don't know basically um it, it was a french colony and um the african slaves had an uprising and they basically used machetes to physically liberate themselves from the europeans took over haiti made it a free state the first free state in the americas um and basically every european country <laughs> punished it economically for that they said we don't want anything to do with Haiti. We are not having any commerce with Haiti. And so the Haitian the government and Haiti itself has been pretty poor for the entirety of its existence. It's clearly worse now than it was in the beginning because of the gang situation, but it's always been very poor because no one wants to trade with it because France has a lot of allies. So he brought that up, which is, you know, drama from the 1800s. And he said, we need reparations now. We need France to give us money. We need the Europeans to give us money because it's your fault that he is what it is. Um, and I, I thought it was just very bold. I don't think it's 0% justified. I, I do think that a lot of unfair things happened in the, the founding of Haiti. And, and Haiti did, you know, Haiti inspired the American Revolution, basically. It was dominoes. You, you got, after Haiti was liberated, Every other colony in, in the Western Hemisphere said we can do it too. Um, but at the same time, do I think you and I should be paying reparations to Haiti? Uh, no, <laughs> absolutely not. Um, but that is essentially what he used his speech for, um, which I thought was, was definitely you know, an, an audacious attempt.